Where do you think you're going, Christopher Columbus? By Jean Fritz. Page 50. In September 1493, Columbus set out on his second trip to the Indies, pennants flying, trumpets sounding, flutes playing, and cannons saluting on all sides. He had 17 ships this time, 1,200 men, seamen and colonizers, five personal servants, six priests to convert the natives, a pack of attack dogs in case of emergency, and 50 horses to carry the men to and from the gold mines. Adelante. On the way to Hispaniola, Columbus checked new islands for gold, but instead he found cannibals. He didn't linger. And pineapples. Delicious. Still, he knew that gold lay ahead waiting for him. Piles of it, perhaps. So he didn't worry. At 10 o'clock on the evening of November 27th, Columbus and his men arrived at Hispaniola, expecting a grand reunion with the 39 men left behind. But there were no lights on shore, no sign of life where the fort should be. When Columbus fired his cannon, there was no answering shot. Going ashore the next morning, Columbus found the fort burned down, the Spaniards dead. Columbus went to see his friend, the king. What had happened? Tears ran down the king's cheeks. A fierce neighboring tribe had killed the Spaniards, he said. Why? Well, the Spaniards had behaved badly after the admiral left. They had rampaged over the island, stealing from this fierce tribe and mistreating their women. The king said he'd tried to help the Spaniards, but the enemy had been too strong. Three thousand men, all angry. It was clear that the wreck of the Santa Maria had not been the miracle that Columbus had supposed, but he didn't admit it. Certainly, he didn't give up. He was the kind of man who was always sure that the next day would be better and the next place would have gold. But nothing went right. Obviously, it was not safe to settle where the fort had been, but the new site he picked, Isabella, he called it, was a poor choice, far from fresh water and alive with mosquitoes. The settlers were unhappy and uncooperative. They had come to the Indies to collect gold, not to work in fields planting crops. Moreover, they resented Columbus, who wasn't even a Spaniard, ordering them about. And they took sick. Sometimes as many as 400 were sick at the same time, in spite of the fact that Columbus had bragged about how healthy his Indies were. The doctor of the expedition said the Spaniards were not used to native food, their own crops had not come up or not been planted, and the food they had brought with them was running out. The queen's ships would have to be sent back with an order for more supplies. But send them back without gold? Columbus had promised to return 12 of the ships right away, but he had also promised to load them with gold and spices, which the 39 men would have collected in their fort. Columbus managed to scrape up some gold, but not enough even to pay for the expedition. So, along with the gold, he sent a supply of what he hoped was cinnamon, but it wasn't, pepper, that was too strong, sandalwood, that was the wrong color, also 60 parrots and 26 natives. Three were cannibals. When the ships had left, Columbus led a formal expedition inland to Sipangu, or Sibau, as the natives insisted on calling it. They did find some gold, in rocks, in sand along the riverbank, in the possession of natives, but there was no sign of a gold mine. Moreover, Sibau was just like the rest of the island. In no way did it resemble Marco Polo's Sipangu. Even Columbus had to admit that. It might be the land that the Queen of Sheba had ruled in Bible times, Columbus thought. Like most people of his day, he was far more interested in finding ancient mysterious places known to exist than in discovering new ones. Any sailor blown off course might stumble upon a piece of unknown land. What was the glory in that? But he had been wrong too many times lately. He had to be right soon, or people might say these weren't even the Indies. Indeed, the Portuguese were already saying it. All Columbus had found, they claimed, was a bunch of islands. So Columbus left for China. The queen had instructed him to make sure that what he called China— and the natives called Colba or Cuba, was really the mainland and not just another island. Columbus had no doubt about the matter. Of course, Colba was a peninsula, firmly attached to a continent. But to please the queen, he followed the coastline until he decided it wasn't necessary to go farther. He had found proof enough. In one day, for instance, he had counted 164 new islands. 
Didn't that sound like Marco Polo's account? And what about the three white men dressed in white tunics that a sailor had seen in the woods? There could be only one explanation. Prester John and two of his followers. And the animal footprints? Big as a lion's they were. One even looked like the print of a griffin that Sir John Mandeville talked about. Indeed, Colba had to be China, just as this land had to be the Indies. Columbus had been born to find the Indies. His whole life couldn't be a mistake. God couldn't be wrong. But in case anyone disagreed with him, Christopher Columbus had his entire crew sign an oath swearing that Colba was part of a continent. The crew was told that if any of them ever denied this, he would have his tongue cut out. When Columbus returned to Isabella in September 1494, he was sick from nervous exhaustion. What he needed was some good news to cheer him up. What he got was bad news. The mosquitoes were thicker than ever. The people were in turmoil, roaming the island, stealing from natives, provoking fights. Some troublemakers had even run off to Spain in stolen ships to spread stories about what a bad governor Columbus was and what a failure his colony turned out to be. And what about gold? Ships were waiting in the harbor right now to take gold back to Spain. But there was hardly any gold. What could be sent in its place? There was only one thing that Columbus could think of. Natives. So Columbus had 500 natives captured and placed on board, placed on shipboard to be taken to Spain and sold as slaves. African explorers were always sending Africans back to Spanish slave markets, Columbus told himself. Besides, the natives were all heathens. It wasn't as if he were selling Christians into slavery. In fact, there was not a single Christian native in all of Hispaniola. The converting had gone as badly as the gold mining. As soon as the ships had left, Columbus introduced a new system to bring in gold. The settlers were not doing a good job, and unfortunately he had found none of Sir John Mandeville's gold-digging ants. So he turned to the natives again. Every native over 14 was ordered to turn over one of his small bells filled with gold dust every three months. The bell was not big. Still, it was too big. No matter how hard they worked, the natives couldn't find that much gold in the washed-out riverbeds. But when they failed, they were punished. Many ran off to the hills and hid. Some left the island entirely. Between 1494 and 1496, one-third of the native population of Hispaniola was killed, sold, or scared away. In March 1496, Columbus left for Spain to try to set things right with the king and queen. He had been away for two years and eight months, and he had a lot of explaining to do. He couldn't understand what had gone wrong. God must be punishing him. But for what? Perhaps he had been proud and had shown off too much. So as soon as he landed in Spain, Columbus put on the plain brown robe of a monk. Next to his skin, he wore a rough prickly shirt. Then he proceeded to the royal court. Just as before, he had a parade of parrots, natives, and men carrying gold samples and tropical curiosities, but people paid little attention this time. Remember that fellow who found the Indies, they said? Well, he was back again. That man with the beard in the monk's robe, limping from arthritis, that was the one. They called him Admiral of the Mosquitoes now. A man who would sail all the way across the ocean with only some wild-looking birds and mosquito bites to show for it. Sure, there was gold, but was it real, they asked? The king and queen had, of course, heard the stories, but they weren't quite ready to give up on Columbus. They would send him out again, they said, but this time he was to work harder at converting the natives. <clears throat> so on May 30th, 1498, Columbus set sail. This time he was to explore south before going on to Hispaniola. Europeans <clears throat> generally believed that the farther south one went, the more gold one would find. Columbus dedicated this third voyage to the Holy Trinity, the Christian idea of a threefold God, and promised to name the first land he discovered Trinidad. Once at sea, Columbus became his old optimistic self, ready to call every piece of good luck a miracle. Indeed, what else but a miracle kept them all from burning to death on the way? In one week of intense heat, casks of wine and water burst, wheat caught fire, bacon and meat were roasted to a crisp, but the men survived. And what about Trinidad? When the shout went up that land was sighted, there on the horizon was an island with three mountain peaks, three right in a row, three for the Trinity. That couldn't be an accident, Columbus said. Across from Trinidad was a continent which we now call South America, 
but it took Columbus a while to recognize that it was a continent. He wasn't expecting one, and it wasn't easy to fit it into the jumble of geography he had fixed in his head. If this was the Indies, and of course it was, and the mainland of China was north, what on earth had he discovered? Finally, he realized that this must be where the Garden of Eden was. All men say, he pointed out, that it's at the end of the Orient, and that's where we are. It was impossible for Columbus, or many Europeans at that time, to imagine a whole new world that had never been heard of. Columbus couldn't stay to look for the garden. He had supplies to deliver to Hispaniola, and as usual, trouble was waiting for him. Revolt, corruption, sickness. For two miserable years, Columbus tried to govern Spaniards who didn't want to be governed and didn't even want to be where they were. Most particularly, they didn't want to be governed by Columbus. Indeed, there were so many complaints about him that the king and queen of Spain decided to find out what was going on. On August 23, 1500, Francis de Bobadilla, a special representative of the crown, arrived in Hispaniola. The first thing he saw was a gallows on which seven rebel Spaniards were hanging. Bobadilla never tried to find out the right or wrong of it. He simply arrested Columbus then and there. Nor was it enough to jail him. Bobadilla ordered him put in chains, but no one was willing to fasten chains on the governor general, the admiral of the ocean sea, and the viceroy of the Indies. At last, Columbus's cook stepped forward. He'd do it, he said. He didn't mind. So Columbus was put in chains and locked up for two months in Hispaniola. Still in chains, he was sent to Spain. He was offered release, but he refused to have his chains removed until the queen herself gave the order. When they were finally taken off, six weeks after his arrival in Spain, he put the chains on a mantelpiece in his house and asked that they be buried with him. They weren't. His chains had become another sign that he had been specially chosen by God. They were his private cross. For didn't the most faithful always have to suffer the most? But Columbus didn't suffer quietly. He let everyone know how wronged he'd been. Why, if he'd given the Indies to the Moors, he said, he couldn't have been treated worse. The king and queen reassured him. They hadn't wanted him in prison. It had been a mistake, and they'd see that Bobadilla was punished. Columbus would receive a share of profits, just as he'd been promised, they said, but they didn't say anything about his going back to the Indies. Columbus was 49 years old now, but his hair was white, and he was so stiff from arthritis that he seemed older. But not too old, he told himself. He wasn't done with the Indies. There was still another trip in him. Indeed, it wasn't easy to stay quietly at home in Spain while other men were exploring his Indies, crossing the ocean sea that no one had dared to cross until he'd taken the fear out of it. At least five men, some including Amerigo Vespucci, who had helped Columbus in the past, were leading their own expeditions. Reports came back of strange islands discovered, an island of giants, an island where men ate grass and chewed their cud like cows. And what was Columbus doing? Sitting on dry land, twiddling his thumbs. Farther nor north, a Genoese named John Cabot, sailing for England, claimed to have reached the land of the Great Khan, Actually, he went to Newfoundland. But the man who was causing the greatest sensation was Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese who had succeeded in making the voyage that King John had dreamed of. He had not only sailed around Africa, he had gone on to India, where people were civilized and wore clothes. In 1496, he had returned with spices that were real spices and stories that matched up with Marco Polo's. Now, in 1502, Vasco da Gama was going again, but he was still taking the long way around, Columbus insisted. What's more, Columbus wanted a chance to prove it. All he had to do was explore the western part of his Indies more thoroughly, and he'd find a passage that would lead to the other side. From there, it would not be more than a ten-day sail to India. What Vasco da Gama had found was merely an extension of his own Indies. The king and queen were willing to give Columbus his chance. After all, they didn't like Vasco da Gama's success either. They provided Columbus with four ships, 135 men, an Arabic interpreter, and a letter of introduction to Vasco da Gama in case they should meet in that confusing place both men called the Indies. They also laid down two rules for Columbus. No more slaves. 
no stopping off in Hispaniola, which now had a new governor. They expected Columbus to find the strait or passageway, proceed to India, and then sail home around the world. If this didn't work out, he could stop off in Hispaniola on the way home, but not on his way out. Columbus didn't care how many rules there were, no matter what he called himself, no matter what the king and queen had official that no matter that the king and queen had officially restored his privileges, he knew that he wasn't really governor or viceroy of anything now, but at least in March 1502, he was back at sea. Columbus called this fourth trip his high voyage, perhaps his last chance to sail through his beloved Indies, to rejoice in the soft mornings, to lose himself in the night sky. Certainly it seemed as if this time everything would go well. Twenty-one days he had of smooth sailing, right in a row. Twenty-one nights of clear sky, every star in its place. But when feathery clouds raced across the upper sky, when the sea swelled and rolled in from the southeast, Columbus knew that a hurricane was in the making. As it happened, however, he was near a safe harbor. Hispaniola. Of course, he wasn't supposed to go there. He could obey the queen, sail past, and perhaps drown at sea, but he didn't like that idea. Instead, he sent a small boat ashore with a messenger to ask the governor's permission to enter the harbor. The governor said, no. A storm? The governor was sending the queen's fleet of 30 ships back to Spain the next day. That's what he thought of the weather, and he didn't want Christopher Columbus coming ashore and making trouble. Columbus's face turned a fiery red. To be refused shelter in the land he had won for Spain. To have to scurry around in search of a protected cove when his own harbor was right there. Still, when the hurricane struck, Columbus was ready. And when it was over, his four little ships were safe and sound. But not the Queen's fleet. Nineteen ships went down. Five hundred people were drowned. Among them, Francis de Bobadilla. Indeed, indeed, only one of the Queen's fleet made it back to Spain, and that was the ship carrying Columbus's personal possessions, which he'd left behind when he was arrested. The governor and his friends said that Columbus had performed black magic. Columbus said that what had happened was a miracle, pure and simple, and no more than he deserved. As it turned out, that hurricane was only the beginning of a long siege of stormy weather that pursued Columbus up and down the coast of what we now call Central America. Whatever violence the sky could do, it did. When it ranged, when it rained, Columbus said, it wasn't rain, it was a deluge. When a storm started, it went on and on, once for 28 days without a let-up. Other tempests have I seen, Columbus wrote in his report, but none so long or so grim as this. And as if rain, thunder, lightning, and wind were not enough, once a mammoth waterspout appeared, a whirlwind-like column of water that sucked up everything in its path. In the face of such danger, Columbus felt he had to do something. So with his Bible in his left hand, he raised his sword in his right and traced a cross in the sky. Then he drew a large circle, which was meant to enclose his four ships in safety. Pretty soon, the waterspout dissolved. But no matter what he did, Columbus couldn't find a passageway to India. Up and down the coast he sailed, stopping to ask natives the directions to a waterway across the land. As usual, the Spaniards used sign language. The natives nodded, pointed, and made their arms into a circle, which the Spaniards understood to mean water. Again and again, Columbus followed directions. Again and again, he came to water just as the natives had promised. Every time, it was a bay, or a lake, or a lagoon, never a passage leading to India. On Christmas night, the four ships anchored off Panama, not more than 32 miles from the Pacific Ocean. But even if Columbus had known how close he was to the other side, there was no way to reach it with his ships. And if he had reached it, he would, of course, have seen another whole ocean spread before him, although he'd have no way of knowing how big it was. In any case, by this time, Columbus had given up the idea of finding a passage. Gold. That was what he was after now. North of Panama was a land where he'd found more signs of gold than he'd found in four years in Hispaniola. 
Indeed, it was here, he said, that King Solomon of biblical times must have had his gold mines. Columbus spent the spring in this country, building a fort to serve as a trading post. But right from the beginning, the natives had been suspicious and unfriendly. They had a strange custom of turning their backs when they spoke, which, of course, made sign language difficult. But it was clear that they didn't care to talk. On April 6, 1503, a force of 400 natives attacked the Spanish fort, and before the fighting was over, 12 Spaniards had been killed. <laughs>